because here I'm changing the concentration from about a hundredth of a mole per liter to about a thousandth of a mole per liter of hydronium ions, right? Whereas between six and seven, I'm changing it from a millionth to a ten millionth of a mole per liter. And it doesn't take as much hydroxide to do that, right? I think it's going to be okay. So the hydroxide solution is dripping in at a constant rate, right? But we don't see a gradual increase in pH, do we? Now, as it passes through a pH of 7, the curve is almost vertical. The only reason this doesn't show that extreme slope uh, is because there's a delay in the response time of the pH probe. Now, can you guess what the rest of the curve is going to look like? The amount of HCl it took to go from here to here is much less, excuse me, uh, sodium hydroxide than to go from 10 to 12. So it's going to be like this. Huh? We call it an S-shaped curve. So we're going to use this basic procedure. We're not going to use a pH probe. We're going to use phenolphthalein instead. Phenolphthalein. Because phenolphthalein changes from colorless to a pink color right between these pHs here. And the first hint you get of a pink color, you know the pH is close to 7. And that's where we'll stop. Because the idea is we're going to add hydroxide ions until we've added as many hydroxides as there were hydroniums, and the pH would be 7, huh? And the phenolphthalein will tell us where it's pretty close to 7. Now, why will the phenolphthalein, if it changes color someplace in this range, why will it tell us when it's really close to 7? It turns out it doesn't need to tell us that it's really close to 7. If we make a graph, pH on the vertical scale and the volume of OH minus solution. The graph that we made with the computer is kind of volume on the horizontal axis. It's really time, but I was dripping it in at a constant rate, right? But if we make a graph of volume of hydroxide solution, the curve looks like this. And at a pH of 7, the slope of that curve is almost vertical. Now on the graph it wasn't that way because there's a delay time with the response time of the pH probe. So we don't get that nice vertical uh, climb. It would, uh, would be much more vertical if I could add the sodium hydroxide instead of over a period of 5 minutes, add it over a period of 15 minutes. If I added it much more slowly, uh, we would see that curve be almost vertical at a pH of 7. Now, if the phenolphthalein changes color someplace between there and there, are you looking? Because this is the key point. What is the difference in volume between those two points? Tiny. You're going to find, you're going to find that I can take 
part of a drop. Form a drop on the tip of the, of the burette that's not a full drop and wash that in to the solution and it'll take the pH from 6 to 8. Part of a drop is less than 0 0.01 or about 0 0.01 milliliters. So if you can get it within 0 0.01 milliliters, that's within one part in a thousand or better. That's pretty good, isn't it? And it's because the slope of that curve, we don't need to know when it passes, when it's exactly a pH of 7. Because of the slope of that curve. So we're going to be able to use a process very similar to this. And Monday I'm going to demonstrate the actual process you'll use to do titrations on Wednesday. Okay, and I'll be giving you some hints. But uh, I will be demonstrating to you the process that we're going to be able to use to be able to with a known hydroxide ion solution be able to figure out what the concentration is of an unknown HCl solution. Now, why is that what we need to do, something we need to do? This is the way I buy hydrochloric acid. This is HCl gas dissolved in water. And because we don't want to ship, we want to pay as little as possible to ship this here, we buy it those of us who buy this, we buy it in as concentrated a form as possible, right? Uh, the more concentrated it is, the less weight there is, because this is still mostly water, right? Okay, the problem is when I buy a concentrated solution of this, it's about 12 moles per liter. When I open the cap, this is a saturated solution of HCl gas dissolved in water. So what is it that's above the liquid? HCl gas in equilibrium with the solution, right? And every time I open the top, guess what I lose? HCl gas. So the more I open the top, the less concentrated this solution becomes. So not only do I not know the accuracy of this solution when I buy it, but that concentration changes over time. So if I'm going to make an HCl solution and know what the concentration is, I have to do a procedure like this to actually determine what that concentration is. Now I can make a solution that's about 0.1 molar, right? But if I need to know it accurately, then I need to do a procedure like this to determine its accuracy. Is it effervescent when you open it? No. No. It would if the pressure above the liquid was more than one atmosphere, but it's not. How are we doing? Now, to do a quantitative procedure, we need to measure the volumes of these solutions accurately. And we use a burette to measure the volume of the solution that we drip in. Because we're going to drip in drop by drop by drop until we get that end point that we want, when the phenolphthalein just changes color, we can put it in with this valve drop by drop. We can make a measurement of the volume before we start adding solution. We can make a measurement of the volume when we're done and subtract the two and find out how much solution has come out of the tip. Get it? The HCl solution we will measure with something called a pipette. This is a burette, B-U-R-E-T. This is a pipette, P-I-P-E-T-T-E, -E, I think. Now, what's a pipette? Um, glass tube. We use a pipette loader. In the old days, the chemists used their mouth to suck the liquid in. You can guess why they don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know, after a few of them died, they went. Mm. So we have a pipette loader. It has a piston inside, a thumb wheel. When I rotate the thumb wheel, it raises a piston inside and will draw a solution in. I will get a colored solution that I can draw, draw in. <laughs> so that you can see it in the pipette. That little brown slime all blue. No, the color's not really making it very visible, is it? Now, there is a 
There is an etched line. I have to put my glasses on so I can see it. There is an etched line on the pipette. You can't see it, but it's a fine etched line that is there. And if I lower the level to where the bottom of the meniscus is right at that etched line, then this pipette will deliver, when I hit the little valve right here and let the air out, it will deliver 20.00, excuse me, 25.00 milliliters to about accuracy of about 0 0.02 milliliters. Now, it doesn't contain that much because when I'm done draining the pipette, there will be a thin coating of liquid inside and about half a drop that stays in the tip. So that etch line is made not to have this contain 25.00 milliliters, but to deliver 25.00 milliliters. And in fact, uh, measuring instruments are marked with the letters TC or TD. This is marked with the letters TD because it's to deliver that volume. And I believe the graduated cylinders we have are marked with a TC. And this was not marked with anything. Graduated cylinders are often marked with the letters TC because when you have the meniscus right at a particular <coughs> line, that's how much it contains as opposed to delivers. So we will use pipettes with a pipette loader to measure the volume of our HCL solution very accurately because you're going to be expected to get results uh, within a tenth of a percent. And it's quite doable with the glassware that we have. We're measuring volumes with a pipette and a pipette loader. These are used to measure fixed volumes. This measures 25 milliliters. It's no good at measuring 20 or 30 milliliters or 17.6. A uh, burette is, made to, um, is uh, designed to measure varying amounts um, and uh, we use it because it has a valve at the bottom and we can drip in the amount that we need and then measure how much we've added. So then do they make pipettes to like... Do of different, different sizes? Yeah. So there are one milliliter pipettes so and two milliliter pipettes and five milliliter pipettes and tens and twenties and fifties and... Make 17, they don't. They don't. Yeah. But, the, you know, the idea is that a pipette is made to, uh, for a particular fixed volume. But there are different sizes made for different uses. And have you ever seen the... Um, the uh, video when they're doing uh, DNA experiments and they've got the little thing with the button on it and they're yeah that's a that's a, a different kind of pipette. Wait what? We we could use two burettes. We could do that. But I want to introduce you to the use of both. So we will use a fixed volume of the HCl solution and then figure out what volume of the known sodium hydroxide solution we have to add to reach that end point that we're shooting for. We could add two burettes, the, we could use two burettes. The advantage is that the volume of HCL that we're using in each of our trials, because you're going to be doing this until you get three trials that you're confident in, because we're using the same amount of HCL in each trial, you should use the same amount of this solution in each trial. right? And you can get an idea of which trials maybe didn't work out very well based on, you know, ideally, theoretically, the volume you use in each of your titration from the burette should be exactly the same. It doesn't end up being that because of error, but, but it should be. Okay? Acid-based titrations will devote most of Monday to prepping you for doing the acid-based titration lab which will take virtually all of Wednesday, and I'm hoping to have a test on Friday. Okay, acid-based titrations is all we need to do. There's another.